mercenary villain on the old naval base. It was a coal depot for the naval steamships. It was actually here at building number one in 1898 that the USS Maine floated on its coal before she came to Havana, Cuba. Upon arriving at Havana Harbor, it suddenly like, exploded. Do something this was a major catastrophe in 1898, the explosion of the USS Maine. That one single event propelled the United States into the Spanish American War. The third floor of the building number one served as a, uh, a sales maker's loft. You know, there's two parts of the U.S. We have Old Town Key West, which we're in right now, and we should we'll go into New Town Key West, which we'll talk about when we get over there. But this is Old Town Key West. There's another building that we by a number on the immediate right, the Red Ring Building. It was originally the Customs House. It was it housed the customs of, uh, officials and also the post office. There was a circuit court were in there, and also uh, the, the uh, district courts were housed in there. These days, uh, um, the Museum of Art and History is very well done. I hope you have a chance to see it. As we move forward, if you look to the right, there's a tan building. This is the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum. Inside that museum are exhibits that contain treasure of Spanish galleons, most notably the Atrocia in the Santa Margarita, which are two Spanish galleons that sunk in a hurricane off the Florida Keys in 1622. Mel Fisher, the treasure hunter, he went on a 16-year quest to find the Atrocia in the Santa Margarita. Every day he would rally his crew by saying, today is the day. Finally, on July 20th, 1985, he found the Atrocia, then soon afterwards, in Santa Margarita. You know, there was actually a son who fell on the ship. To date, they brought the $400 million worth of treasure and they're still bringing it up even today. A lot of that treasure is on display inside the museum. They can pick up one of the silver bars. When I say silver bars, they're about that long, about that thick. It's inside a wooden box. You can pick it up. You can't take it with you, but you can pick it up. You know. uh, it's, it's interesting. You want to put your nose in Treasure. And this is step number 1A, the Harry Truman Little White House. Harry Truman loved Key West. He spent 11, 11 working uh, vacations here in, in Key West for a total of 175 days. These are the presidential gates. They were installed in 1906. They only opened for sitting presidents and former U.S. presidents. They voted for President Truman, obviously, and President Eisenhower, uh, President Clinton, President Carter, President Roosevelt. Uh, just to name a few. If you go behind the sidewalk, about uh, maybe half a block down, the entrance to uh, the Harry Truman Little House, uh, White House is on the left. Yeah. Key West loved, uh, Harry Truman loved Key West. Yeah. Key West loved Harry Truman for sure. This is, there's plenty of presidential libraries uh, around the country. This is a presidential museum, the only one in South Florida. Across the street, this white building is the birthplace of Pan American Airlines. This was her ticket out office in 1927. Pan Am started an international seaplane service, transporting both airmail and passengers to Havana, Cuba. These days, this is the first light restaurant in breweries. It's a great place for a bite to eat. A round trip ticket to Havana, Cuba would be back and cost you $9.90. So, Pan Am was the, city, the principal and largest international air carrier from 1927 all the way to 1991 upon the collapse. I think Delta Airlines bought their remaining assets. If you continue looking to the right, you see a sidewalk just past the way to your fence. In the back is a little cottage. That was the winter home of American poet Robert Frost. He spent 16 consecutive winters in that little cottage back there. This is the second oldest house on the island. If you look to the end of the porch on the left, you see a well. They call that a pirate's well. There was a first recorded freshwater source on the island. It was used throughout the 1700s. This guy's mad at me. On this corner is the Joseph Bates Porterhouse. Dr. Dr. Joseph Bates Porter did extensive research on the spread of yellow fever. Much of his research led to many of the quarantine laws we have even today, and eventually the eventual eradication of the disease in this area. Yellow fever is a mosquito. It's spread by mosquitoes is a real issue here in the early part of the 1800s. As we move forward, coming up on the left is the Curry Mansion. Captain William Curry, he migrated from the Bahamas in 1827. He became a very wealthy man. He made a fortune in merchandising. The shipwrecking industry was an enormous industry, and also the tobacco industries. In fact, he was the state of Florida's very first millionaire. Upon his passing in 1897, he was the wealthiest man in the whole state of Florida. He left a significant inheritance to each one of his children. They went on to build beautiful mansions around the island. 
coming out of here and on the first next portion of your tour welcome. The red brick building on the left what, in here? Is, is the City Hall building, the old City Hall building. It was, it was dedicated on our centennial, July 4th, 1876. It didn't survive the big fire, 1886. So this is the second version of City Hall. It was built in 1892. But it has four clocks on the tower, and I'm all for the law. <laughs> but I do like the building, don't get me wrong. I like to see the staircase. It's granite. You don't see a lot of granite on the island. Uh, and also, the, I like the wrought iron work. This is called wrought iron filigree. Not only the gates and the front, but if you look in the back, the stairwell going up, we need more wrought iron for the place to the more ways. Here it is, you guys, one of the more famous landmarks on the island. Sloppy Joe's Bar. This is Ernest Hemingway's favorite watering hole. He was very good friends with Sloppy Joe Russell. They were fishing partners, and they made frequent trips to Havana and Cuba together. You know, uh, Ernest Hemingway even uh, mentioned Sloppy Joe's Bar in his novel, Citizen of the Some of the best photographs I've ever seen are heard in Ernest Hemingway. He ate the king of the walls inside this establishment. You can go for any other reason. You should go in and check out the floor with Ernest Hemingway. It's a very rare photo.
when I sit down overseas, I wait. I'll point it out when people buy there. Tennessee uh, Williams from the U.S. Lived his whole life here until his passing in 1983. So coming up on the right hand side, you can see a CVS drug store. I usually don't talk about CVS drug stores, but this building was a former Crest Five and Diamond Harvest store. Does anybody remember Crest? They were they, they dominated the, the, the United States in the early part of the 20th century. They were in any corner. Uh, Crest Five and Diamond. The Harvest stores. Samuel Henry Press. Um, and if you look on top of the CBS building, you can see the old Press signs still up there. Press, they were known for their beautiful, their beautiful buildings. They were like pieces of the world. Uh, press, five and nine department stores. Going on and on. You know, we can watch from there. All right. Thank you. 
one of my favorite stops because the uh, Ernest Hemingway Home is a block up on the left hand side, which is probably one of the best tours I've taken on the whole island. And across the street from that is the Key West Lighthouse and the Key West Lighthouse Keeper's Quarters, right across the street. You can also get a bike to eat here. It's a fun area. Here's step number five, Bahama Village. You can go to the Ernest Hemingway Home and check out the lighthouse and then come back when you're ready. And you can be joined a tour right here. This is what we're doing here right now. So here, you sure, sure. Of course. <laughs> For those of you who are just joining us, welcome aboard, you guys. And my name is Bailey. I'm going to be your conductor. Um, there's no question anymore. You know, Ernest Hemingway bought this and lived in this home with his wife, Pauline. That was his second wife. He was married four times. Pauline was his second wife. It was actually Pauline's uncle who acquired the home at a tax sale for $8,000. He then turned around engaged in the couple as a wedding present, nice guy. See the red brick building on the left, uh, the, the wall that wraps around, that's the Ernest Hemingway home. It's on the biggest lot on the whole island, one, one acre. You don't see a lot of one acre houses on the key last year, and this one has it. And it all said the first eight round swimming pool on the whole island. We're sitting on a core water, which is not easy uh, to build eight rounds, uh, eight round swimming pool. But they have one here at the Hemingway house. There's 52 cats on the Hemingway property. All of them are descendants of the Hemingway family cat, Snowball, which is a six-toed cat. The tour guys know the name of every single cat on the whole property. It's amazing. What, what a great tour. You can see there's going to be another wedding tonight. There's a wedding almost every night at the Hemingway house. Everybody wants to get married there. It's a nice property. And across the street is the Key West Lighthouse. I was telling you, I climbed up to the top. You get a beautiful perspective of the island. What I liked about it is just schematics with arrows and point of what you're actually looking at. You really get a great feel for the island from up there. With just 88 steps though, if you want to climb up there. Uh, this is the Key West, Light, uh, Key West Lighthouse Keeper's Quarters. If you look over at the building, you'll notice there's two front doors. That's because being that lighthouse keeper was a massive responsibility. It was it was a, it was too much for one he, uh, family to handle. So two families lived there. So it's built like a duplex for two different families. They shared responsibility of operating the lighthouse. You know, being that the lighthouse keeper in that time period was a good gig, I'm sure. I bet it wasn't an easy job to get, but it was a lot of responsibility. People's lives depended on the decisions you made inside that lighthouse. Nothing to take lightly, really. Uh, where it's kind of hard to see the lighthouse because it's above us. When we take this left on Truman Ave, if you look over your left shoulder behind you, you can see a real good uh, view of the Key West Lighthouse. Significant influence on the island. 
like Harry S. Truman, for example. Remember, he spent 11 working vacations here for a total of 175 days. Truman Ave turns into Roosevelt Boulevard. President Roosevelt was the president from our biggest Navy years. We are a Navy town. The Navy's arrived here in 1923, and they've already increased their presence over the years. Off of Roosevelt Boulevard is Kennedy Drive. President Kennedy was here twice. Once in 1961 for the Bay of Pigs. So our Cuban neighbors, to this day, refer to us as Stella Morris, Star of the Sea. This next church coming up on the right is how it, it's how it got its name. It's the Basilica of St. Mary, Star of the Sea. It's the oldest Catholic church in South Florida. Yep. They had their first service. But it's coming up on, on the right. It takes up a whole city block. You can see a, a stone wall on the right. St. Mary's has had a significant influence on the evolution of the island. For example, they opened a, up the first African American schoolhouse in 1867. Uh, and also, when the USS uh, Maine suddenly exploded in Havana Harbor in 1898, Mother Superior of the church offered up the the Naval Hospital to the Navy, and she also offered to have the nuns serve as nurses. In fact, the nuns of St. Mary's treated over 600 wounded uh, uh, soldiers from the USS Maine catastrophe. It, it, it absolutely was a catastrophe. If you look over to the right, past this grassy area, you'll see a, a coral structure in the background. That's called a prayer grotto. It's made of all coral rock. Grotto is another word for a cave. There was a sister who lived here the name of Sister uh, Louise Gabrielle, and she lives in three hurricanes, most significantly the hurricane of 1919. It was especially deadly and dangerous. She was so thankful that she had survived that she felt she should do something. So she decided to build a brick of prayer rock, and then she built it herself. Every coral rock she put in the place, she would say a prayer over each rock. And when she finally finished the prayer rock, in 1922, it took a while, three years. She declared, as long as the Prairie Grotto stood, Key West would never take the brunt of another hurricane again. And so far, it's been 100 years. We have been hit by hurricane head on in 100 years. We were sideswiped a couple times, most recently, as a matter of fact, but we haven't taken a full hit in 100 years. So thank you, Sister Gabrielle, for you. So Key West has one of the most historic, uh, the largest historic districts in all, in all Florida. We have more than 3,000 houses that date back to the early 1800s. First question, question people ask is, how in the world these homes survive, uh, considering we have the hurricane belt? They're called conch houses, C-O-N-C-H, but it's pronounced conch, conch houses. They're historic homes. And a lot of these conch houses were built by shipbuilders, and they had a few tricks up their sleeve, one of which is they used tree nails, which is nothing more than a wooden peg that would take the place of the traditional metal nail and allow the homes a little sway and flexibility in the wind. Also, the homes are built two to three feet off the ground, which allowed the hurricane winds to go underneath and around the homes. Instead, the hurricane winds hitting the homes broadside and knocking them off their foundations, which is what happened 90% of the time. Once your house is on its foundation, it's over. It, it, your house will tumble in the wind and it turns into firewood. I want to talk about these trees. These are called K-pop trees. You can see them on the right. Check out the root structure. 80% of the root structure is above ground. Very cool trees. I love them for my backyard, although my backyard is not big enough. But very cool trees, the K-pop trees. Here's a good example of some conch houses on the left. You know, the interesting thing about these conch houses is a lot of them don't have homeowner's insurance because we're in the hurricane belt find insurance. If you do find coverage, it's terrible. So what they do is they have a special account. And the money they would normally pay to a premium, they put it in this hurricane account. And they save it up. And then when a storm comes, they go to the account and use that money to fix the homes back up. I know what would happen in my case. I would get into that money for sure. Something would happen and I would tip into that money. By the time the hurricane came along, I'd have eight bucks in my hurricane account. This is a, a Volgato village. Um, at 
Eduardo Gatto, he was a very prominent cigar manufacturer here in Key West. He was very good to his employees. He built them this park so they have a place to relax on the days off and spend time with their families. At the time of his passing, he turned the land over to the city of Key West. The stipulation that always, always would remain a park, which you can see it, it still is. We're now transitioning into Newtown. We'll talk about Newtown in just one moment. But right now, I, I want you to take a look to the left. Mine's way better though. <laughs> don't, don't tell me I said that. 
So Key West has had a couple different names over the years. But the Spaniards versus discovering Key West, they call it Kiowiso. In translation, that means Bone Island. That's because they found human bones all over the island when they first arrived, ancient human bones. So they called it Kiowiso. These bones were presumably from warring Indian tribes from hundreds of years ago. Over the years, the Kiowiso phrasing kind of just warped into Key West. Kio became Key, and Wayso just became West. You know, every day is a beautiful day here in Key West. I, half of the season, half of the year, I get towards the New England. And um, we've learned to appreciate nice days in Boston and New England. <laughs> you know, you, when we get a nice day in Boston, we will go up and say, nice day, nice day. When we come to Key West, we start talking about a nice day. It's not that they look at you like you have over your heads. Every day, they, they just take it for granted because every day is beautiful. And it goes right over their head. The average temperature here in Key West is 77 degrees. The highest ever recorded temperature in Key West is 97 degrees. So here we are, the southernmost city in the continental United States, and we've never made it to 100 degrees. That's because of the sea breeze. It's never too hot, never too cold, usually perfect. Um, the lowest recorded temperature on the island is 41 degrees. That makes Key West a frost-free zone, baby. That's right, frost-free. <laughs> the driest city in the state of Florida. I got caught in a rainstorm yesterday.
December 7th. There's three resorts here. The Marriott Peace Sides across the street. They have a great tiki bar. You can sit by the water's edge and order appetizers. Uh, 24 North is behind us. It's a great place for a bite to eat as well. Here's stop number seven. Here's another stop where I made up my numbers. I never know how many seats I have. It's a guesstimate, you know what I mean? Dispatch 497 17. I mentioned Stock. I mentioned Stock Island to you. That's another 70 miles full of west of are right now. So I have two ways to get to Stock Island. One is by seaplane, and the second way is by boat. Unless you can swim 70 miles, that's it. I would take the ladder. I'll let you guys see the same plane. I'm taking the boat. Uh, but they call it uh, uh, the dry tortogas, they call it. I'm sorry, I was talking about the dry tortogas. Uh, they call it the dry tortogas because there's no fresh water there. Now they have it because of the pipeline, but there was no there was no fresh water on, on at the dry tortogas. So I mentioned that Mel Fisher earlier in the the treasure director, he discovered the Atrocia in the Santa Barbara in the Wonder Bia in 1885. Uh, now. We still make up the treasure. But that's where he found the treasure. A little bit east of the dry church opus. They won't give us the exact location, but that's where right they found the Atrocia finally. They stumbled upon it, of course. And that always the way. They looked for it for 16 years and accidentally find it by a
this is not number nine, but the Chucky doll is inside there. Okay, what can you tell me? Not one single iguana. I can't believe it. We'll see some at our next stop for sure. Oh, I see one iguana. All right, next, behind the anchor, against the wall, he's got his back to us, but his head's sticking up out of the grass. Do you see the iguana in the grassy area? Again, if you find an iguana that you like, feel free to take him home with you because the locals, you'll get no complaints for them. Unlike the chickens, I'm sure you folks have seen the chickens all over the island. The story with the chickens, they came over with, they came over with the original Cuban refugees. The Cuban people were escaping civil war in their country in that time period. So they, they brought with them livestock, including the birds. Not only as a food source, which it was, it was also part of their culture. And that would have been cockfighting. Uh, cockfighting was enormous in the Cuban culture in that time period. So Key West never liked the idea of the cockfighting, even from the very beginning. But they tolerated it. And then we became a bird sanctuary, along with the other 800 islands off the Florida coast. We're all bird sanctuaries. They outlawed cockfighting. So all the birds were released into the wild. And the birds you see now are descendants of the original birds that came over with the Cuban refugees. And they're protected by law. It's against the law to hassle a chicken. If you chase the chicken, it's a ticketable offense. They can write you a ticket up to $500 for chasing the chicken. They have the Key West Code Enforcement Officers. They have white cars with a big blue emblem on it. And they enforce these, these bylaws on them, you know, absolutely. So don't mess with the chickens. Take an iguana, but leave the chickens. All right, enough about the chickens. What? What's this? Are you coming with us? No. <laughs> no. Okay. All right, she said, get out of the way. This is the Key West International Airport. The pilots give us a hard time. They say the name is longer than the runway. <laughs> That's a little bit. Saturation. It's, it's very user friendly, especially when you compare it to other airports around the country, like Atlanta, for example. Because uh, that's what we have. You make an abrupt stop and a very quick descent. It's a, great, it's, a great, it's a great airport. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the reef, the barrier reef, the coral reef out in the, in the horizon. It's 170 miles long. It runs from Key Biscayne, Florida, which is just uh, next to Miami, all the way through the key, Florida Keys out to the Dry Tortugas, which is another 70 miles from the west than we are right now. It's the third largest reef in the world. The largest coral reef in the world is off of Australia. Then the second largest reef is off of Brazil, and we are number three. Back in the 1600s and 1700s, this is an extremely busy shipping lane. I mean extremely. Two to three hundred ships a month would come through the, the Florida Keys on the way to different destinations around the world. This is back when navigation was crude, to say the very least. They would navigate by the stars, and they'd have no way to predict the weather. They could be sailing into a hurricane, and they would not have a clue. At least two ships a month, on the average, would crash onto that coral reef. These were wooden gallons, so they didn't fare well when they crashed on the reef. This led to a very long-lasting and very lucrative industry in Key West called shipwrecking. It lasted for 60 years, and the money was just pouring in. The shipwrecking industry, there were 60 foot towers along the waterfront's edge. People that were in the towers were watching the coral reefs for such, just such an occasion. One of, one of the galleys would run up on the coral reef. The person in the tower would yell down to the people on the ground, wreck ashore, wreck ashore. The, the word would, would fly, fly through the island. Within 30 minutes, the entire island would be aware that there was a galley down on that reef. It was in peril. They rushed to the boats and out to the shipwreck. One of the, the first person to arrive in the shipwreck was the MVP, the wreck master. He would be, they would be in town with the vast majority, the biggest percentage of the cargo that was recovered. Uh, the first priority was to rescue the passengers and the survivors of the shipwreck. Once they were safely ashore, they went back to the cargo. Now, the cargo could be anything. It could be something as simple as rain or lumber. It could also be the mother load, gold, silver, jewels, who knows? Uh, lots of other very valuable items. They would salvage it and 
This is they use it uh, for the irrigation of the landscaping, you know? No one want us here either. As we move forward... There's one right there. On the oh yeah, there's a green one out there. <laughs>
I like it because the southernmost point buoy is ahead of us, two and a half blocks on the left hand side. You can actually see it from here. It says 90 miles to Cuba, the southernmost point in the continental United States. People see it online for two blocks long to take their photograph of the southernmost point buoy. It's right up here on the left side. Also, the southernmost house is here, which is really interesting. We'll talk about it. And also, the New England Butterfly and Nature Conservatory is on the right. Well, there's 20 different variety of tropical birds and hundreds of free-flying butterflies. You can shop around, look around this area, then you can come back when you're ready and you can rejoin the tour. Uh, right now, there's a trolley by every stop every 30 minutes. Here is stop number 11, the southernmost point. Be very careful here, guys. Watch every step. Don't let anybody rush you, okay? I know. We'll talk later. Are you from, are you from Miami? No, you just like the shirt. Yeah. Bye, guys. My pleasure. Thank you for riding along. I appreciate that very much. Very much. Thank you. Well, I got here last night at 6 30. The line was like I know. 40 people. Every day, even at nighttime, there's a line. Yeah. Hey, I remember you guys from earlier. Yes, you did. Welcome aboard. Yes, we're back. Here's, the, here's another stop where I can totally make up my numbers. Let me see. You know, the next house we're about to see is called the, the Southernmost House. It's another Curry mansion. Remember I talked to you about Captain William Curry? At the time of his passing in 1897, he was the wealthiest man in the entire state of Florida. And he left a significant inheritance to each one of his children. They built mansions all the city. This is another Curry mansion. It was, it, was built by, it was built by Judge J. Binding Harris and his wife, Florida Curry. She was the youngest daughter of Captain William Curry. This is the first house on the entire island that had electrical power. Thomas Edison designed the system and helped install the system. He was in Key West in, during the World, uh, real World War, War I period. He was working for the Navy. He was experimenting with, experimenting with depth charges. Thomas Edison developed 40 underwater weapons for the U.S. Navy in that time period. They were all friends. Now the Harrises loved their team. So the whole second floor of the southernmost house is one big ballroom. I'll show it to you.
Eduardo Gatto. See, he was a, he was the number one cigar manufacturer on the island. Remember, there was 166 prominent cigar manufacturers on this one island. Eduardo Gatto was number one. He built these houses for his employees. He didn't give them the houses, but he allowed his employees to live in the houses, and they promised to stay loyal to his company wow. and not go anywhere else. The cigar meat uh, workers were very well taken care of and very well paid. Um, people would try to steal away your best your best uh, workers. There are 166 uh, cigar manufacturers on one this one island. So he, I guarantee you, some of Eduardo Gatto's employees they they live in some of these houses. This is called the Silver Buttonwood right here. See that? They're all over the island as well. Silver Buttonwoods. And on the right is the New England Butterfly and Nature Conservatory. I mentioned it earlier. There's 20 uh, different variety of free-flying uh, uh, tropical birds and hundreds of free-flying uh, butterflies. My grandkids were scared of the, uh, the butterflies. I guess they flutter in your face a little bit, kind of yeah. freak them out. So they didn't like having supplies by that. I thought they would love it. You never know with these kids, you know. <laughs> but on Fridays, yeah, it's, called, it's called Pink Flamingo Day. There's two pink flamingos inside of there. And on Fridays, they let them out of their habitat, uh, and they allow them to uh, walk amongst the people. Pink Flamingo Day. This is Upper Duval. And it, it, not only the number is different, but the atmosphere is different. This is more uh, fine dining up this way. It is art galleries and studios. Uh, we will most of loud music and live music and party revelers are on Lower Duval. Not exclusively but for the most part. I like both sides of I uh, of Wall Street. It depends on what you're looking for. It's pretty laid back up here. I, I like that. You know, it depends on my mood. If you look over the right, this is called Latina. It, its original name was a Teresa de Marti. With translation, that's the Terrace of Marti. Jose Marti, who a lot of people refer to as the George Washington of the Cuban independence movement. He would give rally speeches from that second floor balcony. The locals had a lot of trouble pronouncing it, just like I just did. So they, they shortened it to La Tida. Uh, on the left of the wraparound New Orleans, New Orleans looking wraparound uh, porches, that's the former Cuban club. A new arriving Cuban uh, refugees to the country would pay a small membership fee, and that would entail to the, the Cuban club, which supplied them with medical facilities, education, uh, opportunities, and also social services. You know, Moving to a new country when you're not familiar with the language or the culture can pretty, be pretty drastic, you know. You definitely need a support system, and that's really what the Cuban Club was. It was a support system for the new arriving people to the country. Here's stop number 12. You can walk down to the southernmost point, Bui, or the Butterfly Conservatory, then come back when you're ready, and you can rejoin the tour. Uh, right now, we're going to join by every stop, every 30 minutes. Welcome aboard, you guys. If you're looking for seeds, you're talking to the right person. <laughs> if I have anything, I have seeds. Okay, I hope I'm hard. And my name is Bailey, and I'm going to be your conductor uh, for this next portion of the tour, which is not much fun to do, but welcome to the Thank you very much. What's that? I don't know yet. They haven't told me. They haven't told me yet. But I'll let you know. <laughs> They, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm, oh, I am lost. <laughs> I thank you very much. Right. I'm actually on time. That's unusual for me. I'm always being accused of being late. So, the, there's a couple things I want you to try. A very short list of some things I were hoping you could try as far as the food on the island. There's a Bahamian flair to most of the food here on the island. I want you to try three things while you're here. Yeah. One is the Cuban food. Oh, the Cuban food, I think Key West, number one, has the best Cuban food in South Florida. I honestly believe that. A lot of people think Cuban food is spicy. It's not. It's very hearty and rich. It's excellent. Try the Cuban food. Second on my short list is conch. It's spelled C-O-N-C-H, conch, but it's pronounced conch, like conch on the head. Go back to an American Revolution. Uh, British sympathizers couldn't have felt very comfortable here in the U.S. They, just, they were fleeing the island in groves, heading for the first crown, for the first crown colony, which would have been the Bahamas. 
There was such an influx into the, ba into the Bahamas that the Bahamian government decided to put a tax on the food. And <laughs> the Bahamians were having none of it. They said we'd rather eat cock. So they developed 20 different ways to prepare cock. Cock soup, cock stew, cock fritters, cock fries. No, I don't know about cock fries. <laughs> but I want you to try cock. Try the, the, the cock the cock, uh, the cock soup. It, it, it's, it's a different taste of clam chowder. It's the same texture, but it's really good. Conk. These are conk shells right here on the window on the right. Those are called Key West Pink Conks. It's the smallest the type of an animal. They're inside the shell and they crawl along the ocean floor. They're not snails, they're conks, they're mussels. Very good eating. You've had clock, Kevin. You should tell you. Watch every step. Thank you so much. Thank you for riding along, you guys. Thank you. You can rejoin the tour right here. Give me 30 minutes. There'll be one more trolley by here in 30 minutes, right? One more? Oh, no, you have more than that. How many trolleys more do you have? I'm going to 215. I don't know either. See, we're closing early today because of the speedboat races. Normally, we start tours all the way up to 430. But they're shutting down Duval Street because they're doing the parade of all the speed boats that are coming in. They're all being housed at the Truman Annex if you want to go there to see them. Thank you so much. So for those who are just joining us, my name is Bailey. I'm going to be your conductor for at least one more stop. Our next stop is back to Mallory Square. I want to talk to you about the Sunset Festival. It's every evening here in Key West at Mallory Dock, which is where the cruise ships come in. There's dancing, great food, right? Um, street performers, great music. And you know what the best thing about it is there's no charge. It's every night in Mallory Square and, and on, the, on the dock, on the waterfront. I'll point it out when we go by there. It's a very good time. And uh, if you're going to be in the area, you might as well go to the Sunset Festivals. I must say, they do have some nice sunsets around here. I don't know at what point my life has started appreciating sunsets. It happened at the same time frame I started appreciating foliage. It all happens at the same time. But go to the Sunset Festival, you'll have a very nice time. And the price is right. This is, see it says Fort Zachary State. Uh, is, there's a Civil War fort out there called Fort Zachary. To the left, uh, one block ahead, you have to go by a little guard shack. That's where all the speedboats are being housed. It's, it's Waterfront Park. Some of the best beaches on the whole island are at Fort Zachary at the Truman Annex. Uh, it's a lot of fun over there. This is called Jackson Square. And Andrew Jackson was the president-elect when, when Key West was incorporated. Here it is, you guys, on the right. The most photographed mile marker in the entire state of Florida. The mile marker zero sign. And here it is. It's also the most stolen mile marker sign on the whole island. People are always trying to rip off the sign. Uh, they've gotten hip to this, this ripping off the sign thing. It's so it's secured with these big bolts. You would need a cutting torch to get that thing off of there. And they, even if you do get it off the pole, it's on camera now, so they'll, they'll have you within hours. It's like, it's like the buoy. The guys that set the buoy on fire. Same thing with the sign. They did find you like that. <laughs> so don't try it. The other end of the mile marker zero is 2,200 miles north of here in Fort Kent, Maine. That's the, under, the other end of Room 1. I always wonder, do they try to rip off their sign too? This is the post office on the left. It's designed to look like one of our, like one of our uh, Civil War uh, forts. It was designed by a local architect. Not even a point. Not only was he a local architect, he was the five-time mayor of Key West. World Book of Records. Apparently, he water skied from Key West all the way to Cuba. It's still a record that stands today. Sunny McCoy is right in the Guinness World Book of Records. He designed that. It's supposed to look like one of the Martellos, the, uh, the Civil War, uh, War Fort Martellos that I showed you. This is the banyan tree. The interesting thing about the interesting thing about banyan trees is the root structures drop down from the branches. When the roots hit the ground, you can see it right here hanging down. There is my car. Another trunk goes up, and the banyan tree will expand from one piece of rock to the next, to the next, to the next. This is all one tree, the banyan tree. The biggest banyan tree in the United States is in Hawaii. 
The second biggest painted tree in the United States is at Thomas Edison's estate in Fort Myers. And the biggest painted tree in the whole world is in India. It takes up five acres, one single tree. Uh, this one is the uh, Key West uh, Shipwreck Museum. See the tower? That's the uh, authentic tower. That's exactly what the towers look like during the shipwrecking industry, just exactly like that. That's a great museum. You also get a great view from the top. You can climb to the top of the tower if you want. Again, I love this red big building. It's a museum of art and history. We saw it earlier in our tour. Are there any Guy Harvey fans on board? Guy Harvey is a very popular artist in South Florida, especially down up and close to the east side of South Florida. When you walk in, when you go into the museum of art and history, there's a spiral staircase, right? And what Guy Harvey did is he depicted the story of the old man to see my artist anyway in sketches. So as you walk up the stairs, it tells the story of the old man to see in sketches. It's outstanding. You have to see it. It's inside the museum of art and history. We're almost at Mallory Square. If you were wondering, Mallory Square is named in honor of in honor of Stephen Russell Mallory. He was the one surviving son of Ellen Russell Mallory, who they call the first, the first lady of Key West. She arrived here in Key West, in Ireland. The same, the same uh, route? It's the same, it's the same tour with a different conductor okay. and a different perspective on things. Thank you, they sir. Thank you. I appreciate that very, very much. Very informative. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. Mm -hmm. I do. I really do. Be very careful, you guys. Watch every single track. 